Good evening, everyone. A very buggy day to you. Welcome to the daily wrap-up and Q&A for Bama Bug Fest on the web for the Water Bugs Day today, July 14th. We have been collecting all of your questions and comments about the event content during the day, and we'll be asking our panel of experts to help us answer as many as we can. These daily wrap-ups happen live every day on Bama Bug Fest on the web at 7 p.m. Central Standard Time. I am Catherine Edge. I'm the director of the Warner Transportation Museum, a happy committee member of Bama Bug Fest on the web, and your moderator for the Q&A sessions this week. We are joined this evening by Allie Sorley, Education Outreach Coordinator at the Alabama Museum of Natural History, and Justin Snipes of the Comic Strip. You might recognize them from the programs we've had throughout the day. They've been kind enough to agree to come back this evening for a quick Q&A session. Thank you all for joining us, and thank you for helping us with the event today. How did everything go? It is weird being on this side of it and not moderating. <laughs> no, it's good. It was great. Today was a good day. Um, I really liked it. I know Justin get, didn't get a chance to join us during the presentations today, or the, I'm sorry, the, the chats today, but he was kind enough to come and still help us out for this daily wrap up. So thank you. <laughs> I'm do what I can. <laughs> We really appreciate it, Justin. Um, let's jump into uh, let's jump into a couple of comments and questions. Um, so I guess we'll, the easiest way to do everything will be to start with our ten o'clock uh, ten o'clock session. Um, before I jump into that, though, um, for anyone who is tuning in live, if you have any questions for our panel um, for any content that you saw today, whether we have the guests joining us or not. Feel free to include those in the comments section, and we will get those questions and comments to the individual to um, answer answer your questions and make sure that they see them. So, um, just because we don't have a guest from today's segments on right now, don't hesitate to ask a question. If you have one, if as you're tuning in, we will make sure that the correct person gets those questions and comments. Um, so, I um, so first of all, the uh, the going buggin session that happened at ten. Um, that broadcasted at 10 o'clock this morning. Um, Allie, can you tell us exactly what location you and Todd ventured to within the county to um, to to go bugging? Yeah, so it's one of our favorite ones. Um, we, we have a couple of standard places that we go, and one of the standard ones we have is Hurricane Creek, which is a parapark. Um, however, uh, some with all the, the rains that we've been having lately, there was a, um, a sewage overflow event that I think you guys have seen in the news. Um, and so we decided to not walk around in sewage water, which is, you know, a pretty water. good thing. Um, we water. also, you know, yeah, <laughs> we also listened to the warnings that the city gave us and did not step foot in those waters. Um, I believe the warnings are still active. So if you decide to visit Hurricane Creek, just keep an eye out for signs. Um, but so we went to our other standard, which is at the Spillway at Lake Nickel, which um, is one of my personal favorite places in town. Um, the Lake Nickel has got the part where you can do the hiking on the big cliffs um, that some people jump off of, but you're not supposed to. It's against the rules. Also, it's really dangerous. Um, and then you, there's also a spillway part of it. Um, which is nowhere near that park. It's off on a different road that is um, just beautiful. I mean, it's gorgeous. It's, you know, spillover from Lake Nickel. There's a part, the part that we were at was kind of up of the spillway. So there's these big falls and then some shallow stream areas and then these big rocks where the, it falls over into sort of like a lake area. So we were on the top part of it on the, the, the shallow stream part of it, which is the perfect bug in environment. Fantastic. And um, and that's somewhere that um, that's somewhere that you you venture to often to investigate our local local biodiversity and local environment. Yeah, we do um, that. We've used that space um, often in our um, museum, you know, environmental education stuff that we do. And then me personally, I I run away to there often and just hang out near the water and you know just be in nature. Um, it's gorgeous. It's gorgeous down there. So, well, I I have to admit I've lived in I've lived in Tuscaloosa all of my life, and I have never ventured in and around the the Lake Nickel area. I've I've driven over the spillway, of course, plenty of times, but have never really gone into that section. So um, that is something that I would actually like for you. I'd like for you to take me there sometime because I, I had no idea that it was so close to me uh, while I was watching the segment because it looked it looked very comfortable and very 
very peaceful. So I thought I want to go to war. Um, yes. So <laughs> you'll have to take me. Absolutely. Um, I'd be happy to. I, well, I appreciate it. Um, you were joined during that segment by Todd Hester, who is yes. um, an environment or environmental educator with the city of Tuscaloosa. Um, and uh, so what, what was it like for you and Todd to go out and, and make, make the video? Yeah, so uh, Todd was the former naturalist here at the museum. And so he came in to help me in just his environmental educator role as like just him. Um, and uh, because I don't know, he's, he is one of the most entertaining individuals you'll ever meet in your life in many ways. But he also is, I mean, one of the best environmental educators I've ever met. Um, he won Environmental Educator of the Year last year. He's just, he's incredible. And so um, he also has a passion for watershed education and a passion for aquatic insects specifically um, and has taught me a ton. I mean, I, you know, have been at the museum for a long, for longer than I, I don't know, where am I at? Like eight years, I guess I've been here. And I, I've been with him since day one and have learned so much from him. And every time we go out, we learn something new. Um, he's also, I think I mentioned this before, but he's also hilarious. If you guys got to see the really, <laughs> or the end of that video, there was some post credit scenes <laughs> where we were doing a sound check and he's just, he's, well, he's wonderful. He's a great guy. Yes, we, we, we definitely miss Todd around the museum. <laughs> around the museum. We're, we're happy for his new professional ventures, but we miss him around the museum. Um, one of the, um, so one of the more specific questions from that segment, um, I believe either you or Todd talked about indicator species. So can you tell us what indica indicator species means? Yeah, so we were talking about aquatic insects as indicator species, and the, the reason they are is because, um, first off, they are, um, well, so they live in the water. For, for most aquatic insects, they start their lives and live most of their lives in the water, and that's something that we talked a little bit about in the MILT, Dr. Uh, Dr. Ward segment at four also, but they, um, some of these species like of Helgramites, like we talked today, can live in the underwater for from a year to up to three years, and they are... Um, some of these species of aquatic insects are really uh, sensitive to pollution or um, not enough oxygen content in the water and any other like of those environmental factors. And so if you're not seeing any of those, um, there's in three groups, there's group one, two, and three. And group one is the one that's like really um, sensitive to pollution events. And then group two can handle, tolerate a little bit, but not much. And group three can handle um, a little bit more than the, than the others. So if you are only seeing, you know, if you're seeing these dragonfly larvae that have been there for four years, dragonfly larvae don't, dragonflies don't do well in polluted areas or areas that don't have a lot of oxygen. So you're able to know that, well, if this dragonfly made it from, you know, um, from very early to adulthood in this, or even close to adulthood, that the water has been okay for three to four years because that thing survived. Um, and so these are kind of important, not kind of super important indicator species for our water quality. Um, and usually when researchers take a survey of an area, they use chemical testing, like what we're all probably familiar with, but then they also try to hopefully take into account the environmental survey. You know, what bugs are they finding under the rocks? Are there fish? Are there plants? Are there everything that the bugs need? Um, are, are the bugs there so they can support the rest of the ecosystem? And then that way it kind of tells us the health of that water. Very nice. So bugs being the probably one of the smaller um aspects of an ecosystem can actually tell you a great deal about the overall health of that ecosystem. Small but mighty. Small but mighty. I like that. Can we make that our, can we make that some kind of Bama book that's motto for the um, We need it on a shirt or something. <laughs> I, think, I think that's, I think that's great. Small but mighty. Yes, Small I, mighty. I agree. Um, but um, so interestingly enough, um, you, the first thing that you and Todd found um, at um, in the Lake Nickel area, you found a helgramite. The first first insect you found was a helgramite, um, which did you plan that? Because that seemed to be theme <laughs> throughout the day and before before this before today. 
Um, I had never heard the word Helgramite in my entire life. <laughs> I've heard it more throughout today with Bama Bug Fest on the web than I have, <laughs> again, in my life. So, um, what, um, so uh, let me, let me see exactly what our question was. Um, it says, uh, was that a plant? It says, I, uh, <laughs> let's see, I'm sorry. I'm trying to, trying to do too many things at once. So it's, uh, so you found a Helgramite as first thing that day. Was that a plant because you knew we, was that planned because you knew we were going to talk about Helgramites throughout the day? Did you somehow <laughs> plant a Helgramite under that specific rock? Look, my people, talk to his <laughs> people. <laughs> We got details worked out. We knew that we would meet at the same time. He agreed to make an appearance. It worked out fine. No, we just, um, it was, and Helgramites just happened to be Todd's favorite one too. And this one was huge. I mean, I'm not like this long. This thing was huge. He was um, very easily visible on the underside of that rock. He yes. Was. I don't know. Justin, have you ever seen like a water Helgramite before? No, I'm very Could sweaty very easily. So outside is not a place I have a general adventure. <laughs> Um, can I share my screen real quick, Catherine, to show Absolutely. one? Okay, let me get a good picture of one up. Here's one. So this isn't the one that we found, but this looks exactly like the one that we found. Um, and so Helgramites are incredible. They're super cool. They are, there it is. You see it? Yes. Yes, I do. They're, what do you think, Justin? They're kind of gnarly, aren't they? Yeah, I don't like anything about <laughs> that right there. That is... <laughs> It definitely, then, it definitely looks like something I don't want to step on. I'll say that. <laughs> hang on. Let me pull up their uh, um, adult form. So as in in juvenile form, they're called Helgramites. But as in adult form, they are called Dobson flies. Let me show you this. And this is what a Dobson fly looks like. So this is the male Dobson fly. And it's got these big long pinchers here, or they're—I mean, they—they they look like big long pinchers, but they really—they don't—they're just—they're not—they're just adornments. I can talk about that later. But um, and then the female ones have things that look more like. Let me see if I can grab one. Come on, internet. Um, they have things that look more like what we there's there's a female. So see, they don't have the really really long ones. They've got things that we like more of what we imagine to be like chomp like mandible chomper things yeah like um, type things right yeah so they start out like this and then they grow up to this <laughs> and so todd found this <laughs> as the first thing and as one of the i say bloopers but one of our like no not included clips is todd making these noises of excitement when he flipped and i didn't have the camera on him and so you just hear in the background like woohoo and he's freaking out because he found this Dobson fly <laughs> or this, yeah. <laughs> or he found this Helgramite, I'm sorry. <laughs> well, I, again, I don't think that it's anything. I'm, I'm super chuffed for you all that you found it. Um, I, I, I wondered, I wondered if it was planted because I thought that is a level of dedication that I think it surpasses anything that I would have expected out in the wild um, during a go and bug in session. Um, but the I, it's it's certainly something that I appreciate in our, our local ecosystems. But again, I don't really fancy stepping on it or having a male <laughs> or female Dobson fly fly anywhere near my face. Um, if you listen closely in that video, these big storms were rolling through. <laughs> so if you listen closely, there's thunder. <laughs> It was a, it was a fun day. <laughs> Again, the level of dedication is, is incredibly <laughs> impressive. Um, but speaking of Helgramite, which again ended up being a very strong theme throughout the entire day, um, <laughs> Justin, these are some questions that are um, are geared more toward your um, expertise from the, the comic book world. Um, so Helgramite started in the Batman comics. How long was he there before transitioning into Superman uh, comics and stories? Uh, well, he debuted in 1968 in a book called Brave and the Bold, which was just a, a DC Comics team-up book. Uh, he first fought Batman and the Creeper, which is a pasty yellow journalist who turns into a pasty yellow crazy person. Fun character, <laughs> but no one cares about him. It's real sad. Uh, but from 1968 until about 1986, he just bounced around to different villains whenever they needed him. 
uh, and then in 1986, DC revamped their uh, their whole universe because every well nowadays it's every 10 minutes, but back then it was every 20 years or so they would streamline everything uh, during what was called Crisis on Infinite Earths, and it was after that when their whole universe reset. He showed up in the Superman books. And that's where he stayed until about 2010. And that was the last time he showed up in anything. In fact, since 1968, he's only appeared 30 to 33 times, somewhere in that neighborhood. Oh, wow. So, so not not really a super villain, um, more a nuisance super villain? <laughs> that, is that a thing? Yeah, well, to put it in perspective, Spider-Man appears 30 to 33 times every month and a half. <laughs> because they put him in everything. <laughs> wow. So, yeah. Yeah, he, um, and he's completely different from the TV show version, too. So I was going to... I've seen clips from the TV show. I'm so far behind. Here, let me show so you. I have an image, a still image of the... It's a little, it's a little freaky. Here, hang on. This is... No. No. Oh, my gosh. Where did it go? I'm sorry. Hang on. I'm coming back. I had it, and then I hit buttons. So has, um, has Pilgrim yeah. always been a villain, or like, was he introduced as a villain, and that's always been his, his character arc, or was he, you know, was he someone normal slash good, and then became something happened, and he became a villain? Yeah, he was a he was a scientist who gave himself this mutagenic sturum and became the Helgramite. And his whole goal was turning other people into Helgramites also. So it's basically ah. think Jeff from the fly, but with less melting. So his plan was with, with this new ability was, whoa, okay, I was not expecting to do that. That's from the show. I haven't seen it. I need to. I need to watch oh, it. Oh wow! So if I'm not mistaken, that was um, that was a, a still a still photo of um, Justice League as um, as Helgramite. Justice was on um, our two o'clock segment, if I'm not mistaken. And um, wow, again, was not expecting that. Um, was not expecting that that particular view. Um, but I guess if you're going to have the uh, Facial features, if you will, of Helgramai, that would be the that would be the way to do it. So, um, and um, so Helgramai is a character that has has more or less always been a villain. Um, mm -hmm. In the comics, is he an entomologist? Any like is, is his character an entomologist, and that's how he knows about these types of um, yeah. creatures? He was an entomologist, and he was just studying bugs, and it's one of those mad scientist things where they're like, oh, I've got this serum. Let's see what it does. And then he injects it into himself because, you know, that's the smart thing to do. <laughs> and after that, he became the Helgramite. The yeah, Helgramite. And decided to, to make a little Helgramite army. Um, so does he always say, since we now know that Helgramites are baby Dobson flies, does Helgramite ever morph into Dobson Fly Man, or does he just always say Helgramite? <laughs> does he always do that? But there was this one time he sold his soul to one of the different versions of the devil in the DC universe and got a power upgrade. That's that's surprisingly common in comic books. Did he when the, with his power upgrade? Did he like did he change appearances or was it just he got stronger Not or really. he's still looks just as ridiculous the entire time. <laughs> Giant features just coming out of its face and a bulbous head. It's a ridiculous character design. Very much out of the 60s. And it stayed pretty much like that the whole time. I think I think is it is it like this one that's on this comic, the first he looks like this? Kinda. Oh yeah, I see him now. Yeah. yeah that's that's his first appearance there, if I'm not mistaken. But yeah, yeah. that's pretty much how he always looks. <laughs> he just uh, slightly changes the color scheme every so often. But that's him. And Does he maintain his his same human number of appendages and arms and legs, or does he have additional Helgramite level appendages of 
extra arms and legs and a tail. He's got the same number of arms. He's just really strong and can jump. Oh, okay. They, uh, All right. They did more like a, a grasshopper than they did an actual Helgramite. Yeah. And I'm not at all surprised. The TV show completely changed everything about the character and turned him into wow. an alien race of things. Much well, better. when did um, when did Helgramite make his um, re reintroduction, reappearance in the as that that the character just sleep race? When did when did that happen? Oh, that's never happened in the comics. No, uh, not in the comics, but I mean, just in the in the overall story that is super. And I'm sorry, I don't. I don't at Marvel, I don't DC. I'm sorry, I'm <laughs> one of those people. Um, so when and I think it just happened recently on the show. I think it was. I don't remember what season it was, but it wasn't uh, that long ago. I don't think. Um, and is he on Superman or is he on Supergirl? Because again, I'm sorry, this is this is the world of you next to me. Yeah, it's, it's the Supergirl show, mm -hmm. uh, which oh, I, am, I am so behind. I mean, I just watched Avatar: The Last Airbender for the first time a month ago. That's that's how far behind on TV shows I am. Good choice, though. That's so good, right? <laughs> uh, I wish they had made a movie, but they didn't. <laughs> nope, doesn't exist. Um, no. Rebecca gave us this little tidbit. She's a Supergirl fan, and you saw her. Um, earlier but she said in that the backstory or they don't really have a backstory in the show um he's just a, a prisoner and a, an alien race like you said and there was like he was like the first alien or like their their alien race is kind of spread across the universe but this was the first one that the supergirl world came into contact with and she also mentioned that if anyone wants to see the first comic book appearance it's on comiXology Yes, thank, thank you very much, Rebecca. If anybody has questions about Supergirl or anything related to the Supergirl verse, um, definitely, definitely catch Rebecca Johnson's podcast on Supergirl. Supergirl Radio, is that is that correct? Um, yeah, I believe so. She knows she knows every everything about it, and um, so that is um, yeah. Anything Supergirl. We have a direct connection if anyone has any questions about Supergirl. Um, I do have a fun little tidbit actually about Hulkermites that, um, again, I don't know if it makes, the, makes it in the comics, but it is a, a real world fact um, that um, the Hulkermite does not eat as an adult. They apparently only, uh, once they turn into dog supplies, they don't eat. Um, they only eat as mites. They can live up to three years in the water with juveniles, and then when they emerge and turn into adults, they don't eat. So they only live one week. Um, and those crazy mouth parts that they have are really only for show and courtship displays in that one week that they are out of the water as adults. So for anybody who was interested in the use of uh, what Dobson flies do um, the week that they're Dobson flies. There you go. Um, that's, I think, and that's one of my favorite parts about them is that they, when it's a lot of insects, you know, like Dr. Abbott talked about it in the two o'clock one, but a, a lot of insects, when they reach adulthood, there are several that they don't have mouths. They don't eat. They just, they become adults. They spread their genetics. They make some more and then they go. And, um, the Helgramites are the same um, way. So they, you know, they can live in that water from one to three. And I just imagine them like getting ready for their first date from those one to three years. And then when they become, when they get to be uh, adults, they get ready for their date and the males put on these like really long <laughs> little mouth parts <laughs> and they're like looking for their little lady Helgramite friend. And then they have a week to do it. <laughs> they just have a week to find a friend and make more Helgramites or make more Dobson flies rather. And then, and then they just are done. <laughs> I don't know, Matt, talk about talk, talk about speed dating, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> that's some intense. That's some intense relationship goals. I will say that. Yeah. Um, 
So um, we have a, a we, there was another another comment that was made um, that uh, the originally drawn Helgramite has some similarity to real world real world inspiration as uh, as Justin was um, talking about in the um, when we were looking at the the comic book page, um, but it isn't exactly. Um, and as we've uh, as, as previously mentioned, the um, the version of the Helgramite villain from the Supergirl show was a much further departure from the real world one. So, Justin, what's your take on if if you know we know the Helgramite exists, we can find them um, relatively easily, or maybe uh, Todd's just really lucky and should go to Vegas with that kind of luck. Um, <laughs> Why, why do you think, um, because we've got a an actual you know creature that this this uh, character is based off of, why why not use more characteristics of the creature itself? Any thoughts? Uh, I couldn't actually hear the last like four words you said. I'm getting interference. So why not use creatures? What? Oh, uh, just why not base the characters? The character Helgramite, whether in the comic or in the TV show, more on the creature itself. Any thoughts? Well, especially in the '60s, it was more of a take a basic inspiration and then just do whatever. It was it was the approach of whatever sticks works because every week there was a new villain and uh, mm -hmm. they were trying to make them you know popular villains, especially Brave and the Bold. That was a showcase to have lesser-known heroes team up with more popular ones. That's why Batman was in almost all those issues. And they would get those smaller-time villains to try and just see what became popular. So they weren't super concerned about getting anything scientifically accurate. Uh, I mean, this is the same era that said gamma radiation turned somebody into a big, angry green guy. So not really super scientifically solid. So more, but, more just science, science for science for fun as a um, creative basis, um, not necessarily purely scientific. Right. It's more the writer. Oh, I heard this word the other day. That sounds fine. Sounds sciencey. Yeah, I imagine them with that. just looking at a picture of a Helgramite and going, "We can do something with this," you know. Okay. I'm suddenly inspired. Yeah. <laughs> suddenly we inspired. got this. Big chompers. Scary little thing. Yeah, we got this. <laughs> um, so the, um, the we have um, a couple of um, um, again the the theme the theme today for um, was aquatic uh, bugs um, in water bugs in general. Um, again, the the strongest thread I think for the day was the hog and light. But we did have a. Um, a wonderful World of Bugs segment that was led by Dr. Milt Ward. That was our four o'clock segment. And um, Dr. Ward showed us an incredible video of a stonefly molting into its adult form. Um, Allie, can you tell us a little bit more about about that from uh, Dr. Ward's Dr. Ward segment? Yeah, um, I can show it to you because I still have it up a little. So if I can show it to you and, 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 and we can talk about it. But it's the most incredible video ever. So if you guys have ever seen like... Uh, cicada husks stuck to trees before. Um, so aquatic insects do similar things. Dragonflies, stoneflies, a lot of them will come up out of the water and shed that last that last husk before their adult form, and then they'll go and do their thing. So um, this one is a uh, stonefly doing, it's it's a video cap capturing that moment, and, I, and it's just wonderful. Because I usually, I feel like we always usually see the last part of that. You know, we don't really get to see the emerging actually happen. So let me show you, I'll show you this again. It'll just pop over a screen. So you see it, it's like coming out and then the, the wings pop up. And this this was, this video, um, Dr. Ward wanted to share with us so we could see this process. But see that its wings pop out and then the rest of it pops out. Blech. I like this part. It's and then it puffs like air into the, the veins in its wings to stretch them out because when the the I was texting I was asking him about if you guys want to find out more about it but the idea for me that that whole adult sized insect is crammed into that tiny larval form and then you know emerges is incredible to me that means everything all of its body parts as it's growing and developing to this adult version of itself are kind of soft and and ply malleable and able to like be crumpled and so um the uh 
the wings are like crumpled and they have to be extended out. And then he said that they have to sit there for like 10 or so minutes until their wings dry out so that they can actually use them. Um, and so, I don't know, it was just fascinating. That video was really, really cool. Um, if you want to learn more about it, though, Dr. War talks a little bit more about it. Um, and he also talked about how, so that one right there is, um, there was uh, some insects have um, a complete metamorphosis and some have a, what they call an incomplete, excuse me, uh, metamorphosis and it's just like the life cycle. So the complete ones have like, when we think of like butterflies having like an egg and then, you know, like egg and then a uh, caterpillar and then chrysalis and then a uh, butterfly. So some aquatic insects go through similar life cycles as that. Um, those are the complete ones. And the ones that aren't the complete ones, what they do is they, their their baby form, their juvenile form looks a lot like the adult form, like same legs and similar body parts and everything. But what they do is they molt and become a bigger version of that and molt and become a bigger version of that. And they do that several times until the final one when they pop out as an adult version and which is what that video was showing you. So it's just kind of interesting. He had a lot of really good insight on water bugs. I'm also a huge aquatic insect fan. So I was kind of nerding out and got real excited about things. <laughs> um, but he had a lot of really good information. So everyone watch the four o'clock one, wonderful world of water bugs. Yes, for anybody that um, anybody that needs uh, is interested in double checking any of the segments that we have um, talked about, um, again, everything is available on bamboobugs.org, and um, all the information is archived uh, throughout the day as well on all of our Facebook pages and our YouTube channel. So there's plenty of opportunity, um, plenty of opportunity to go back and see all of these segments if uh, if you had a chance, if you didn't have a chance to watch them um, watch them live during during the day. Um, so um, I have. Um, there's uh, there's there's one one final question about uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Ward's uh, segment. Um, says um, that uh, you and Dr. Ward also talked a little about why um, why these things are so important. And um, so, Ali, do you have um, do you have any any thoughts? Um, again, any any further thoughts from uh, from Dr. Ward's segment again about why water bugs and aquatic uh, aquatic bugs are so important? Yeah, he um, he made this great point, you know, that the, for two kind of main reasons. The first reason being that um, they are the basis of the food chain. So lots of things eat them, including other aquatic insects like those uh, like dragonflies and, and those helgramites. Those things eat other aquatic insects. But um, they also I mean, they're kind of toward the base of that food web. Um and then they also eat things like algae and bacteria that are in the water. So they're helpful that way. And then they also feed larger things um, like fish. And then, you know, those many fish will eat other fish. And and then we end up eating the fish. And so it's just, you know, it's this great, um, there's sort of, if there aren't any water bugs in the water, then the things that eat them don't have anything to eat. And then they die off and, um, you know, and further and further up. So we have to, it's just, you know, even though these teeny tiny little things or that giant hilgramite that are crawling underneath the rocks and streams that we don't really think about are just critical to our lives. Um, and it's just not something that we see very much, which is neat. And then the indicator species, which, you know, we've all talked about already, they just help us understand the health of our, of our water, which is great. Um, so they're just, I don't know, I think they're a fascinating thing. There's an entire world underneath the water, which I think we all knew about, I guess, with fish and everything. But there's an entire world underneath the rocks in the stream that you're standing next to. And it's just fascinating. I think um, I, I think people um, or the, the broader community is aware that there's so much about the ocean that we don't know because the oceans are so vast and there are parts of them that to this day no human has ever ventured to and come back to tell the tale. And so it, I, I think it's a, a bit easier to think about you know the the impact that the oceans have, and you know how how that you know is you know, can have a global impact. But it's it's hard. Uh, I, I think it's it's harder, but just as vitally important to think about your local streams and creeks and rivers because the exact same the exact same things can happen 
um, can happen there, and that that will more you know could more immediately impact your your day to day life. So um, I think that's that's an excellent point, and um, I'm glad that um, I'm glad that we have a chance to um, share that as part of the, part of the Bug Fest this year. Because um, we we had a we had a lot of comments and questions that last year's physical event that we were able to host about aquatic bugs. There were a couple of um, uh, examples of aquatic bugs that that were available at the event, and so I'm really glad that we were able to expand upon that a little bit more this year. Um, even you know, again, even though we're virtual, um, we're still uh, we're we're still able to talk about it, and again, have that fantastic video of you and Todd, and be able to welcome uh, Dr. Ward and um, have all of his have all of his knowledge. Um, is there? Um, if as they before we um, before I guess before we go, um, Alan, any further thoughts? Justin, any further thoughts for uh, for the evening? I, Not really. Yeah, I think if you if you're interested in in uh, you know learning more about the comic character or about the real ones, there's lots of really great resources online. Um, you can visit the comic strip, and um, you can also visit um, some of these really wonderful like uh, freshwaterscience.org. It's a great um, organization that deals with freshwater organisms, which is what we were talking about today. Um, and then if you're also really interested in it, please check out Alabama Water Watch now. For all those in Tuscaloosa, I'm just going to give you a warning. You're going to an Auburn website, but it's okay. Um, it's worth it. It's all in the name of science. So, and they're good Auburn people. Trumps they're great people. all boundaries and any fan base. So, yeah. there you go. <laughs> and um, uh, Justin, you said, um, you're uh, you're there at the Comic Strip, which is a uh, local local Tuscaloosa local Tuscaloosa business. And um, so, if anybody has any questions about um, Helgramide or any of the other, uh, you know, comic comic book characters, um, what's the what's the best way for them to them to come see you or get in touch with you? Well, I mean, our, our hours are posted on the Instagram and the Facebook, and they can send us messages on there. But pretty much, if you're coming by any time the sun's up, I'm probably going to be here. <laughs> I have no life. So, <laughs> here we are. No, that's not true. Your life, your life is your life is common. Your life is common. That's and with and and if your life weren't comics, we wouldn't have the pleasure of speaking to you about Hogan Might. We don't have all the awesome information about how non super villain but more neutral villain he is. But hopefully that will change. I would love to, I would actually love to see Hogan Might become a super villain. I really love it. <laughs> Well, I be I believe that may do it for uh, for this evening. Before we go, um, I want to remind everybody who's tuning in and who will watch this later that we are still accepting submissions for the Bama Bug Fest Art Contest. The final day to submit is Friday, July 17th, and uh, the submission form uh, will close at five o'clock. So if you have any kind of artwork that features um, features insects, please. Um, Please share it with us and um, enter it in our uh, our Bugfest uh, Bugfest um, art contest. The uh, all the information can be found on the website, and um, there's an entire section with details about the art contest. So everybody, please, please, please get your submissions in by Friday the 17th. Um, I want to thank you all again for joining us for Bama Bug Fest on the web today. Make sure to check us out on Thursday, July 16th for Stings and Biting Things, a day dedicated to programs about insects with chompers and stingers. As always, content appears at 10 o'clock, 2 o'clock, and 4 o'clock with the daily wrap-up at 7, and all times are Central Standard Time. If you aren't able to join in for the live presentations, you can always go back and watch them later as archive videos on our social media sites, YouTube channels, and linked in our handy resource guide. Don't forget to like and subscribe to all of our event partners, social media sites, and YouTube channels. As always, we want to thank the UA Museums, Warner Transportation Museum, Alabama um, Museum of Natural History, Department of Research and Collections at UA, UA, UA's Rogers Library and the Tuscaloosa Public Library for all of your work in organizing the event. Thank you to our guests this evening, Allie and Justin. Thank you so much for helping us out today. 
We appreciate you sharing a little of your time and expertise with us. Everybody tune back in on Thursday, July 16th for Stings and Fighting Things. And everybody have a fantastic night. Thanks for joining us.